Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Liam Crutt. Liam is a investment partner at Reinforced Ventures. Liam, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks Appreciate for coming it. on. Appreciate you being here. It's always fun. So uh, what are we drinking here tonight? All right. So this is Armenian brandy. Uh, this was actually recommended by a Soviet engineer that I know, um, and it's quite good. I, I'm really liking it. What do you think? It's exactly what I said. It's smooth. It definitely uh, calms the means of production. And um, yeah, I feel ready for the proletariat of the world to unite once again. <laughs> it's quite delicious. I like it as well. Yeah. All right. So we talked about doing a Greek word of the day. Oh, um, so <laughs> what, what, it, what it is. Uh, so the Greek word, I guess Koine Greek, not uh, modern Greek word of the day is echo. Echo. So okay. echo in um, ancient Greek used to mean like, holdings or like, like, especially with a household, like the things that were with the property or that the patrician of the household held on to. Um, so we get words today like economics, right? Which used to just mean microeconomics. So the holdings. Oh, interesting. So ECO, it's not ECCO or ECHO. Could be all the above, right? You oh, also have echolocation, right? Or okay. echo, echo, echo. Like, yeah. Uh, a room or a cave can hold a sound. And so all these different words we have in English today have some sense around a, a sustained or a held, you know, either matter or energy. That's very interesting, actually, to conceptualize it that way. I'll have to plan out a word of the day next time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I want to keep doing this. <laughs> that's that's off the cuff. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Echo. <laughs> All right. So uh, what are some of the trends you're seeing lately in, um, in investing? Um, what's coming up? I know we've been in you know, a somewhat of a recession. I don't know what to call it, but it's an interesting time right now. Uh, as you know, a venture capitalist, what's your take on it? Yeah, there's a lot of different angles here. I think I'll start with kind of common uh, narratives that people are putting forward that I disagree with. So you keep hearing about, you know, VC funds having quote dry powder, right? Like, oh, like if you're a startup, like you can raise money, like there's all this dry powder out there. Um, I haven't really seen that. And um, for a while I couldn't figure dry out- Dry powder just meaning cash and reserves. Just like war chests of money, yeah, right? And yeah. they're just kind of like start handing out to companies and like that just hasn't been the case at all. Um, and a number of the funds I've been interacting with have still been fairly cash strapped. And I think there's been two <clears throat> kind of main reasons for it. I think one, with the uncertainty of the environment, a lot of people had raised previous funds and done well in a bull market where you know everything's going great and companies can continue to grow in valuations despite not having much commercial traction. Um, those VCs are now returning money to LPs saying, hey, like, I'm not gonna know what to do with this money, so I'm just gonna give it back to you and uh, you'll still like me and you know, we can do this again another time, which is totally fair. Um, so Interesting. folding. <clears throat> the I other, mean, there's nothing wrong with that though. Like sometimes nothing that's wrong the best move, yeah. Um, the other big thing I'm seeing is that it's, it's not that all funds are equally receiving the same amount, but there's a distribution where very few funds are making the most. So you see these mega funds, these kind of full end funds, which we thought, you know, okay, what happened with Tiger Global is not going to happen again, but there's actually a number of funds there. Like we're going full from like company creation, you know, venture studio all the way to pre IPO. Um, so Sequoia and a number of these funds are getting in earlier to get those low valuations, but if they miss out, Hey, they can always get in later. Um, I think there's a couple problems around here where they're not incentivized for the best deal flow. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're trying to, if, if you're okay with missing the early deals, cause you can just get in the best deals later, then you're just trying to optimize for quantity rather than quality. 
Um, and second to that, I think that, you know, they're going to be constrained on finding these deals. So I expect that we'll see a number of these later stage funds probably change over from being like a traditional venture capital fund to more of like a mix between like a growth stage and a fund of funds. So they'll invest in smaller funds that, you know, still have oh, the focus on deal flow and quality. Yeah. And then just ramp those up. So a fund to fund is where one fund goes to another fund and says, you know what you're doing in this space. We'll invest in you. You put it out there. Other fund takes some percentage in exchange for their expertise and investing in whatever they're good at. This other fund doesn't know. And generally, it's the the second, the third word in that acronym is plural, right? It's fund of funds. So they might have like a portfolio of funds and then they're choosing the best deals to invest in later stage. Um, for the portfolio companies that we have and for you know the companies that I talk to that are fundraising right now, like they're still having trouble getting investments. Um, there's a number of issues of like, hey, do I raise you know two years worth of runway like Y Combinator is saying to do, um, which you know probably might not be in the best interest of some companies. Oh, because that's interesting. These are funds raising two years of runway or like actual companies? No, sorry, actual startups. Got it. Um, that so seems contrary to a lot of the startup mentality that I've seen. With and, either 18 months or one year, it yeah. seems to be more common. Um, so some of them are starting- Two years seems conservative. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut No, you you're good. Yeah. Some of those are starting to extend it out. I think it's been like a lot of the global macro stuff, um, UFOs getting shot down over Lake Your Honor, whatever, <laughs> right? And- um, Is that the Chinese weather balloon you're talking about? No, 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 no. The Chinese weather balloon was shot off the coast of, I think, South Carolina. Oh, the, okay. The Carolinas. So we, we had a something UFO else shot down, shot off of Lake Huron, and something else shot off in, um, I think, Alberta, Canada. After That's it interesting. Alaska. It's been a couple things, supposedly. But what do we know anything about this stuff? This is this is the first. So I'm not a huge consumer of the news, so I'm in the dark about a lot of stuff. Like, what do we, what do we know about the stuff that got shot down? Um, not much at this point. Um, it appears that the Chinese um, weather balloon did have like cameras on and stuff for reconnaissance. And there was a lot of blowback for, you know, the US administration not shooting it down earlier because essentially it got a full pan of the United States. Um, so the question is, okay, is it just that because people could see it with their naked eye, now they had to talk about this, me, you know, these weather balloons have been going around for years now. And it's just like, now that people saw something, they had to do something about it. And then they've been proactive about subsequent ones. Um, is it made up? And it's just a way for DARPA and the DOD to, you know, get more money in the coffers. I, I was know. in a meeting the other day and somebody showed me, um, it was an American and they showed me a similar, no, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it was a Mongolian guy. And he showed me a similar weather balloon that he worked at with NASA, but it was like pretty much the same tech as that weather balloon. And I mean, so we do it no too, idea. I guess, yeah. but I, I don't know. Could it have just been good old fundraising campaign? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, or it could sure. be aliens, you know, yeah. it's always that. Anyways. Um, Cause they'd pick a balloon. So <laughs> companies are, you know, extending their runway. Um, there's concerns around dilution with this. Um, I, th I think really, it's hard. It, 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 you got to choose kind of your one priority, right? And actually, before the industrial era, you know, the word priority only had a singular tense. Um, the idea of there being multiple priorities oh, interesting. wasn't really colloquially used in English, right? So nowadays, saying that like you can have multiple, right? Prios one, multiple first things is, is kind of ridiculous and contradictory, right? Um, but I, I think the one primary thing that companies can have is just like trying to bring on customers and having revenue because at the end of the day, myself and other VCs, when we're looking at these deals, the question is always like, am I catching a break or am I catching a falling knife? Right. And, um, with a lot of the good prices we're seeing, um, with only some of the companies, right. Um, it's uh, unfortunately, it, it's really hard to tell, to tell what pricing is. There's such a high variance in valuations right now because as I mentioned, like those kind of full stack VC funds they're investing from birth to death are, they have the money available. So they'll invest in some of the best deals at the pre-seed or the seed stage. And so um, you're looking at these, you're like, well, why am I getting a good price on this? Is it because, you know, the company has run out of runway, they need to hire people, there's other costs that they have, right? 
negative reasons. Um, and so, you know, we've looked at those deals and decide like that's just added risk. Like it's not a good opportunity for us. Yep. Um, but when we're catching Long the break life. has been uh, those companies that, you know, they their customers outmatch their capacity. So, you know, like one of our portfolios right now, I think I mentioned them on the last podcast, um, Margic, um, you know, they're fundraising right now. And uh, the CEO, you know, she can only onboard one customer at a time. But for every one customer she has, she has three others that she can't onboard. And it's like, brutal. Well, if you give Margaret more money, she can make you more money, right? So it's like, obviously, like, clearly a good thing. What's, what's her company called? Margic. So they Margic. Have, so you said Margaret, so... Yeah, the name, names are similar. That's um, interesting. So, I, yeah. it's, I, so I thought I misheard. No worries. I, I think I'd gone over it last time, but... You may have. I apologize. No, no, no. It's all good. In, in brief, they have a new manufacturing process for organic LED screens. Oh, cool. Um, that'll revolutionize high-cost, high-margin things like televisions, um, military applications, um, but also, you know... Since it's biodegradable, decomposable, doesn't have any heavy elements in it, is more power efficient, brighter. You know, she's doing like liquor bottles and birthday cards and different things like that. Oh, that's that. interesting. Um, so it's like she's owning a huge market, but then creating her own market. You can market put an organic well. LED on a liquor bottle? Yeah, it's pretty that's cool. That's pretty cool. It's flat too. Yeah. yeah. Coca Cola bottles, different things. We, we got to drink that next time. I need to ask her what brand it is. That'd be yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds like fun. That's uh, okay. That makes sense. So companies that are saturated in terms of sales, but could use operational improvements, basically. Yep. That makes sense. Cause if you give somebody money and they've got the sales volume to deploy it, then you're, you're going to see a return on that for sure. Wouldn't say it's for sure, but you definitely hope well, so. Yeah. I mean, most likely. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> So any other interesting companies kind of on your horizon? Um, yeah, for sure. So um, one other thing that's been interesting with the markets adjusting is, you know, there's often this idea of like the baton getting passed on. Um, a lot of these companies we invest in, in whether it's robotics, or biotech, advanced materials, you know, what they're doing isn't new. Someone else may have done in the 1980s, someone else might have done it five years ago. And it's just like a new iteration of that, right? There's, there's no bad ideas um, in the world. Eventually each idea has its time. And so each entrepreneur is just kind of taking the baton and hoping that they're the one yeah, at the right time. Makes sense. Uh, where do you see the next like SpaceX um, type company uh, in terms of what do you think that looks like? Sure, I, I think it's rather tough. So a number of the companies have it's a good way to put it I, I think the last decade was a lot of vertical integration right so you had companies like spacex they're like we can't just build the thrusters for rocket ship right we need like own from the nozzle all the way down right yep. a fully vertigrated company or integrated company sorry i like vertigrated <laughs> this company has so much vertigo um <laughs> and right now what just you know, this hasn't been planned out, but most of the compelling opportunities we've seen have been for kind of more horizontally integrated plays where like we just invest in a stat actuation. They have a novel electrostatic clutch design that is applicable to cars. Tell Stuart to, to come on the podcast. I will tell Stuart to come Thank on you. the podcast. <laughs> um, cars, drones, robots, right? Things that need clutches that are lighter, that use less energy, that are more modular, right? That you can do more things with, but also things like power tools. Like yeah. it's a huge opportunity to replace and have safer, more effective power tools um, with their new clutch design. And it's just these little plates that you apply electricity to and they can either grip or slip and they're really quite strong. Um, other opportunities we've seen have been in the drug delivery space where People have a new method of delivering some therapy, um, but the drug delivery method itself could be its own therapy or have advanced materials applications, et cetera. Um, we've invested in um, new actuator designs, uh, torque limiters, different things that 
you know, applicable across multiple industries that are experiencing. Where do you see applications for torque limiters? Uh, so robot arms, uh, surgical robotics, um, even like a couple of space companies have been listed. So it's like a customers. slip clutch is sort of what you're describing. Yep. Okay, cool. And, um, you know, across all these industries, especially the ones that tend to be more conservative, have uh, less turnover with vendor relations. You know, they're all taking these opportunities now with, part of it is a lot of management, right, retired uh, during COVID. And then there's kind of new management, they're eager to make a name for themselves. And so a lot of these, you know, companies that are just building a component, maybe not getting as much value as a vertically integrated company would like SpaceX. Yeah. Um, but they're able to seize billions of dollars worth of opportunities across multiple completely unrelated industries using the same cookie cutter technology across at least 80 percent of it that's pretty cool i feel like you see that a lot in automotive uh just from my own personal perspective like the tier two manufacturers it almost sounds like is what you're describing yeah it's 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 especially tricky with automotive um I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure well, out. They're trying to squeeze every penny. Like <laughs> and, and oftentimes, like, you, you know, you have some new design that, you know, can improve how well an engine runs or the ADOS system or whatever. And um, there, there definitely is, like, a very slow time frame for doing those updates. So you kind of have to do your homework and look through and be like, all right, was this update in the past 10 years? might not be something people are going to be eager to use. And then if you do add this new component to this car design, is it going to change, you know, 50 or 100 different things on the product? Um, so it can be fairly tricky. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, I mean, I think just because of the scale they're working at, I mean, it's it's a different set of constraints. Like, if there's a 0.01% chance something will go wrong, you're going to have to compensate people when it goes wrong because... You're making enough cars, it's going to be an issue. And then, you know, I mean, if something costs you, you know, I don't know, like $3 more a unit, I mean, amortize that over, not amortize, that's probably the wrong word, but spread that out over, you know, I don't know, like 30,000 units. I, I have no idea, like, how many cars you make of a given model, but it's it's a decent amount. I have some idea, just not a huge idea. And so I feel like you see some interesting stuff. I, I toured some automotive manufacturing facilities about a year ago, um, and I saw, um, I don't know if I can say who, but I saw just the scale of these operations was insane. I mean, they were running, one of them was a $400 million facility that had um, like just an army of Kamau and Fanuc robots in it, you know, doing every task, lifting up whole engine blocks and spinning them around and putting them in CNC machines and then pulling them out and putting in the next CNC machine. And then they'd run the same op on that machine, the same op on that machine. And, um, I mean, it, it's kind of cool what they can do. Um, but, I mean, they're still horizontally integrated. Like, they'll, they'll take tech from over here and bring it in. But, you know, they'll beat them up on the price and the payment terms. And I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting way of doing business. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a slow sales cycle. Um, normally, for our portfolio companies... We'll work with them to get an advocate with one of the OEMs, the tier ones, <clears throat> who can kind of publicize what they're doing, promote it, push for it, negotiate it. And then um, really it's that advocacy that makes it happen or not. That's interesting. Can I ask what portfolio companies you've got in that sector? Uh, sure. So we, we've invested in a um, number of companies, um, mainly on the software side, but like Autometric um, is one, Safa is another company that's been doing very cool things. We have some limitations for what we do in the autonomy space. Um, so it's all autonomy, like with regard to automotive, that makes sense. Yep, exactly. We, we've looked at yeah. we've looked at hardware components for it. Um, and we have some experts for with some of the larger manufacturers, but um, we haven't pulled the trigger on any of them um, so far. That makes sense. That's cool. Yeah, well, I, I feel like autonomy is interesting because at least if it's pure software, I mean, your bill of material is, is zero, right? And so, you know, now you're just figuring out the specs of that licensing agreement, uh, which is... Yeah, and then, but, you know, the flip side of that is vendor lock-in is a lot less strong as well, right? So... How do you mean? So, 
if you you know have the hardware integration and someone's using the actual hardware product it's often more difficult for you to switch to I a see. new vendor but you know having a new software subscription as long as they're willing to match your apis you're you're able to swap it out yep um so you know a lot of the stuff that we see in the computer vision space and um what with some recent examples um with computer vision and like um I guess call it like dev tools for deep tech, right? Um, it's really used to enable autonomy, not necessarily be the autonomy itself. Well, Oftentimes cool. there's like a flywheel where I hate to use the term network effect, but it really is creating like <clears throat> kind of a core corpus of protocols and examples that people in an ecosystem can develop and collect. Well, network effect together. refers to the adoption of that, right? So it's it's if enough people start using it, then you're you're set. And... So it's not just that, okay. but it's, I can, you know, I've uploaded enough stuff to this core ecosystem or um, the other people who, you know, I tend to rely on, they have enough stuff there, right? Like. The, the cost of leaving GitHub isn't just the subscription, it's all the cool stuff that's already on GitHub. Right? Yeah, and there's and so a lot of that. A lot of the dev tools that we invest in and rely on, um, whether it's Safa to a certain extent, Glyph platforms, um, which is more for like robot arms and other applications, not necessarily autonomous vehicles. Um, a lot of these you know, have ecosystems that they're building out where different developers can build out functionality it's kind of beyond what the core team's doing yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah i always feel like it's interesting when people get into uh you know support play like that where you're not doing the thing directly but you're providing the the nuts and bolts to do the thing yeah it's definitely a higher risk but you know if you can get it correct then you know it tends to be stickier yeah well the other thing too is i feel like in if you get traction, I mean, you know, your your risk at least account to account might be lower because, you know, your your uh, portfolio company is not taking on the full risk of tackling all these problems. I mean, they're selling to companies that are doing that, and so I mean, that's that's kind of what we do, you know. Yep. By providing engineering services, so I don't know. I mean, I like it. You know, it's 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 kind of a fun place to be. I mean, at and this point, man, I'm, I'm doing it with emails. You know, yeah. you have to copy and paste a lot of bodies of text. So, how do you mean? Um, oftentimes, you just have so many emails you have to read through that you've kind of standard templated responses for people. You're um, doing that now. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been thinking about doing that. I'd be curious to pick your brain on this because. I'm trying to get more into continual improvement. I have a friend with a... What's continual improvement? So basically, I've got a friend with a small manufacturing entity that he owns, and um, he's been just drinking the Toyota production system Kool-Aid pretty hard. And so continuous improvement... Can, oh, I, I thought you meant improvement. like personally. Um, no, I, I meant, well, sort of personally, like about like spending an hour every day and trying to come up with more efficient ways to do my own job. Okay. So... Apparently, when asked, a lot of people say, you know, the job is very creative and specialized. And, you know, therefore, you know, you couldn't really optimize my job because it's a thinking job. But, I mean, you and I both do pretty specialized functions. The fact that you've already started optimizing your email templates tells me that's probably not true. And, you know, I think some study found something like it was 70 or 80 percent, if I'm wrong, you know, sue me. But like I, I think it's somewhere in that in that realm um, is is automatable of your own job, and so if you're clever and you come up with templates for your emails, you come up with ways to you know make your workspace more efficient. Maybe you have to walk across your whole house to grab the tool you use normally, but if you were to place it next to your desk, you could save you know like thirty minutes out of the day or whatever because you're grabbing it all the time. Um, just little things like that add up. And so the thought is that, you know, my one friend espouses is that you start to see, uh, it's Ariel Eisen for people listening. He has his own podcast called the, uh, was the incremental, the continuous improvement podcast. And so, um, but you know, his whole thing is, you know, if you do this every day, you'll be able to see a return on investment after a year on the hour you spent every day. So you'll get that back in, in time savings. 
And then you're, it's kind of gravy after that. I, honestly, I do think most of my job is thinking, but I, I just feel bad when I don't respond to all the emails I get. Yeah. <laughs> so templated response is better than no response at all. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I think most of my job is thinking too, but I also am open to the idea that I might be wrong on that. And so if I can find a way to Ray Kroc my own job, Liam, I'm going to do it. Like if I can figure out a way to come up with that McDonald's script that like any idiot can pick up and do what I do, I can go on to bigger and better things. So, you know, obviously I want to do it, but... Will it be the bigger and better things? I know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm very how can be sure? proud and happy about what I'm doing, but... You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think process improvement is the enemy. Like, I, I think if I can find ways to make myself more efficient and, you know, like, it, it only serves to elevate your function and, and what you do. And so that's that's kind of what I've, that's the level I've bought in at so far. But admittedly, that's, you know, talk is cheap and that's what I'm doing. So, I mean, I have like some, right? So I've, I've, for instance, like, you know, I, I used to spend about three times as much time I spend every week invoicing and, and doing, um, you know, payments and, you know, all the bullshit accounting stuff you have to do to keep a business running. But I was able to, without hiring any new bookkeepers or anyone, I was just able to come up with more efficient processes to do that stuff by. And so it's, it's been a huge cost savings and it, you know, gives me my time back. So, I mean, I, I want to start applying that, I think, to more and more areas. And so, I mean, the sales process is one of them. Um, other areas for improvement um, that I've thought about. So I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but there's a few. I'm kind of, I'm early on this journey, but it, it seems like a, like a journey worth pursuing. So what are some of the other trends that you're seeing in tech and, you know, the general landscape right now that you're interested in, not interested in just ethically, you know, or as an investor or just as a human? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things that I've been trying to play with in my head is um, a lot of people have been pushing different narratives um, in the US VC market, right? So like some of the big ones, or at least feel like they're becoming big ones have been like American dynamism, right? Which would be like reshoring manufacturing to the US or having dual purpose technologies that sell both to the commercial market and the defense space. Um, and then other, you know, key components would be like Generative AI, that's another narrative that people are starting to grab onto. Um, I think I'd mentioned some of that in the previous podcast. Um, longevity, um, quant self, uh, different things like that. And it, it's quant self? Yeah, so like quantified self, like you wake up, you check your phone app, and you know, like your blood pressure, you know, how much the alcohol you drank last night affected your sleep versus how much alcohol you drank two nights ago, those sorts of things. That's interesting. For like longevity and just like people getting addicted. And to I do remember that you're super into the longevity movement, which is super also, into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the most into it of anyone I know. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And um, so pretty much the appeal is like, can you get people to be addicted to, you know, optimizing their biomarkers like they are their social media accounts or rather oh, that's, instead of their that's social a media novel accounts. concept. Okay. Um, so like a lot of these trends or sorry, a lot of these narratives that people are really pushing into from an investment thesis standpoint, um, you know, while maybe like last decade was really big on like social media, um, ESG, different things like that. This kind of news set definitely plays into this idea that um, Marco Popich and some other people have put forward of um, essentially a multipolar planet, right? So geopolitically, you know, during the Cold War, to oversimplify things, you had kind of two interests. There was the United States and the Soviet Union, right? So it was like a bipolar system. It was like you're either aligned with Soviets or you were aligned with NATO, right? Yeah. So a lot of countries in Latin America, 
Um, Why did they call it the Warsaw Pact? Do you know? I used to know. Ah, no worries. I know you're like a huge history guy, so I figured. And it, I guess it wasn't worth remembering, but I, yeah. I'll totally check later tonight. I just figured like the Moscow Pact might be more. But I guess we said NATO. We didn't say like the America group. I think it was actually done in Warsaw, but okay. I don't remember. You're probably right. Um, so, and, and then, you know, kind of with like a lot of Asian countries with, you know, some of the colonial context and whatnot, um, it was a bit more split, right? And then you had Vietnam War, Korean War, things like that. Or I guess Korean War, then Vietnam War. Um, and then, you know, after that and, you know, follow the Berlin Wall, then you have this monopolar or monopolar um, world where it's like, hey, whatever America does, we do, right? America listens to Britney Spears, we listen to Britney Spears, right? Like kind of kind of from things that are more trivial and frivolous like that to much more serious things, um, you know, all the way down to like what caliber um, gun does your military use, right? Yeah. Does it use five five six or seven six two by thirty nine? Exactly. Um, mm. That's really the only question I understand. Which side of the fence someone's on these yeah. days? <laughs> and um, I'm a big fan of seven six two just because it's half the cost. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you'd be on the Soviet side of the bipolar. I mean, we are drinking Armenian brandy. So. It, uh, these narratives, you know, I kind of mentioned before around American dynamism, um, quantified self, which would be with like um, d- kind of demographic trends in the U.S. right now with aging population. And, and there's a number of other trends we could list out here that uh, VCs are investing into really playing to like the monopolar um, or sorry, not the monopolar, but the multipolar. Thank you. No um world where now it's not just you know the united states has its own agenda and is using you know advanced robotics and um autonomous logistics and other things uh like reshoring um semiconductors here uh, but um kazakhstan has its own agenda now and um sierra leone has its own agenda and guatemala has its own agenda like, oh that's interesting all these company or not companies countries, yeah. countries which in, in some ways are like their own corporations well, for sure i mean when you look at like a country like el salvador i mean that's got like the budget of like a company <laughs> but like el salvador is a great example right yeah. so their president naib he um he's been pushing for like very quote meme like things like having Bitcoin miners running on volcano energy. Um, he's been doing crackdowns on MS-13, right? He's been like doing all these reforms that don't necessarily align with, quote, the US drug war, but are his own, you know, kind of national interests for his country. And so with that, it kind of makes it difficult from like an investment standpoint in venture capital, because it's like, well, you know, we're trying to invest in these companies that are going to dominate the global market. But if each market has its own interest, rather oh. than just assuming they're all U.S. market based, yeah, yep, yep. Right, how do you actually determine if something's going to be a winner take all scenario or not? Um, so a number of or VCs, you just tap into those different markets in different countries. and Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you're seeing VCs starting up in Guatemala and Chile and all these other countries and there's actually like a growing demand and need for that. Like, is there a, you know, um, Spanish native Facebook or whatever, right? Like a lot of these countries are now just like, look, we don't need to use the US version of this um, because, you know, it's um, censored in a way that American corporations prefer. Why don't we have our own version? That's that censored works in a way that our corporations our prefer. Say again? That's censored in a way that our corporations yeah. prefer. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And like, you can't really blame them or yeah, um, sure. clinical trials. Right. So like on the biotech side, you invest in um, drugs that you expect to go through U.S. FDA approval, um, which, you know, that kind of legal tech was exported to most of the rest of the world. And so like you have a lot of these very small countries with very homogenous populations that are still using the same regulatory framework that we use in the United States. It's like is that in their best interest? Like, I don't know, like maybe they should have regulations that are best for them. Yeah, um, and that makes sense. Cause it's very expensive to put something through FDA trials and 
if you're a country that only has, I mean, I don't know what the GDP or the national budget of some of these countries is, but I'm assuming it's closer to the amount of money it costs to send something through that sort of trial, you know, maybe you should have a less expensive trial. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a different population with different, you know, genetic variations, right? The, the people group in that country might um, react differently to the medications that they're on, right? So th there's a whole bunch of factors there, but just like the point is, you know, inv you can't invest in a U.S. company today and or a U.S. startup today and assume it's just going to own the global market. Yeah. Because each of these markets are now becoming new more nuanced and kind of pursuing their own things. So as an investor, do you, are there certain markets you're more interested in than others? I know that your investment thesis favors things that are less noticed um, by other investors. So you're trying to kind of fly under the radar. Um, do you want to go for smaller countries where, you know, maybe other people might be like, ah, I don't care about that. So it's overlooked. Or do you want to go for like, you know, things that are likely to catch on more globally regardless of where they're coming from, or do you focus on certain countries because the probability of them creating something higher creates less work for you and your partner to have yeah, to sorry. sort through? I still think there are a number of things that are, quote, American-centric, um, especially from like a manufacturing standpoint, and those things aren't going to be decentralized across, you know, small, medium-sized countries overnight. So, you know, yeah, we definitely are investing in overlooked areas of deep tech. And a lot of the protocols for autonomy, for robotics, for yeah. medical devices, like, are being built here, right? And yeah. so, like, those are going to be promoted more widely from the United States. Um, and plus, you know, with a lot of these countries, the things that tend to be swapped in and out might be things that are kind of more, more of a fad, more of a buzzword, right? So, like. Um, the type of batteries that make sense in Iceland might not make sense in, you know, an equatorial country, right? Yeah. Uh, due to temperature differences. It's gotta be it. Differences in, you know. Humidity. Uh, maybe yeah. solar panels are better for a country that gets more sunlight yeah. than Iceland, you know? <laughs> well, also in equatorial countries, I don't think you have to actually tilt your solar panels because you can just have them facing yep. flat out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so. so, and then, you know, so on, on the one portion of the spectrum, there's like um, very tail end, like uh, niche, country specific kind of bespoke startups. Um, our main focus is like where those overlooked areas that, yeah, it tends to be in the US, but you know, we invest wherever there's not like a strong. I guess to, to backstep, what I was asking is, do you look for overlooked markets as well as overlooked technologies? No, I just, I, I don't okay. think we have the competency to understand those things. Sense. So. It tends to just be overlooked tax. So when people, you know, are investing in um, end effectors, we're investing in actuators. When people are investing in batteries, you know, mentioned stat already, we're investing in that new clutch design, which it's not like there are other countries making electrostatic clutches. And you, know, you can go into the IP stance um, and strategy that they have globally there as well. Um, another recent example, you know, a lot of people are investing in we're looking at protein folding companies, right? So like um, you have Alpha in um, the UK, you have a bunch of different countries where even Meta, uh, AKA Facebook um, is looking into protein folding now, right? What is protein folding? Uh, so protein folding is using computers to model um, protein design. So if we want to develop a new protein to be used for therapeutic applications, drug delivery applications, or um, drug targeting, if you could use a computer to perfectly model the ideal protein for that application, then, you know, rather than just spending thousands of years in a laboratory aimlessly trying to figure this out with high throughput screening, you can model it on a computer and within a matter of weeks, it can produce the perfect protein for you. That's, that's the goal, right? And we're definitely part way there in some ways. That's but interesting. While everyone's focusing on that, you know, we invest in the you know, not the one, but one of, you know, two or three companies that's doing lipid folding. And we oh, think this is the best approach to lipids, which are essentially fats, right? They have this um, carbon-based or carbon -based head and like a long tail of carbon molecules with, you know, oxygens and different things just decorating it. Hydrogens, I think. Yep. Yeah. And um, it is essentially, well, you can, you know, 
form lipid nanoparticles, which are essentially bubbles that encapsulate drugs that you can deliver to different cells. And by changing uh, the moieties and the mosaic of the LNP, the lipid nanoparticle, you can determine which organs those lipids go to, to That's deliver the payload. Um, you can also have lipids that you're now using as therapies, right? So like everyone takes, not everyone, but a lot of people take omega-3 fatty acids, omega-9, DHA, EPA, like these are all lipids that people are ingesting and using to like reduce their um, inflammation, improve, you know, cognitive function, things like that, right? So they're the one, com they're one of a few companies doing that. Um, there's another in Israel and a few others that um, they're competing with, but still, um, you know, I see it as a global kind of winner takes all market where, you know, kind of local culture and regulation shouldn't be a huge issue in that. So if on the one side you have, you know, kind of very niche bespoke, our main focus is like overlooked areas of deep tech that's going to be a winner take all scenario. And then like on the other hand, you have on, on the other end of the spectrum would be kind of like black swan events. Um, these tend to be like ethically very kind of loaded, morally ambiguous issues, right? So like the US has been very staunchly like against doing, um, you know, um, genetic engineering to humans, right? And yep. so like we've had the capability of modifying genomes in people for a while now. Um, but for whatever reason, we don't do it. Yeah, and, and you know, honestly, there's probably a pretty good ethical argument for like, why you shouldn't do that, right? Like these things are very complex. And like, if you get something wrong, like that's a real human to, you know, whatever degree you agree with that, it's at least the form no, of the possibility. Yeah. It's at least the possibility of a person yeah. that um, you're now destroying, right? And it's like, well, yeah. whose hands have the blood there? You know, it's like, okay, like we would love to take our time to figure that out. But at the same time, like uh, a lot of scientists in China are doing I, you know, we know they're at least curing HIV in at least two, you know, um, so little you'd girls. You'd mentioned this before we started recording. So sure. They, they made two women just immune to HIV for their entire lives. Yeah. So they modified the embryo, the fertilized eggs of these two um, humans. It was put into uterus, uterus screw, babies were born, and they announced to the world that, you know, that these were the first genetically modified humans and instead of saying like oh no like china's got you know china's ahead of us on the race um there was like outrage of like people shouldn't be doing this and um it's kind of similar to you know what you could call global warming or you could call pollution with china right it's like well like we can try our best to like handle and steward their sweet resource as well here in America, but like really like it's not even a dime in the bucket compared to what's happening yep. in China. And so um, I don't know. What just the, in terms of like Beijing, just pumping pollution into the air. Yeah. yeah. Or it, Shenzhen or whatever. Well, I mean, all of the above. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind Chengdu. Of, <laughs> <laughs> Name another Chinese city that has heavy industry. So, so what do you <laughs> what do you do about those issues? And I don't know. And one of the things that could be pretty um, unprecedented, you know, we've talked about escape velocities with previous forms of technology, right? Where it's like, oh, like if rich people have cell phones, poor people will never have cell phones, right? Or if well, poor another, people definitely have cell phones now. Yeah. Poor people definitely have cell phones now. Um, another example people gave was um, AIDS treatment, right? Like, oh, like if 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 rich people have AIDS treatment, everybody like, can get access to prep at this point. Yeah, you know? exactly. And um, you know, do you have that with genetic engineering? I don't know because it's a lot easier to genetically modify a fertilized egg than a whole human, right? You have thou. Or, well, <laughs> Not thousands, you have thousands, you've um, at least trillions, if not quadrillions of cells in your body, right? And to, you know, update, iterate, or get the next version of the perfect genome for you yeah. to have, I don't know, I, I kind of think of it as like the the 1K genome, right? You, you can um, have an IQ of a thousand, you can lift a thousand, you can deadlift a thousand pounds, and you can li live a thousand years, right? So if you could actually do that, I mean, that, that seems easier said than done. 
Like I would imagine you would have to figure out a lot of things that lead to those things in order to sure. achieve that. And, and I don't know what those things are and I don't know how long that will take. My only point is it'll be a lot easier to do that in an embryo than it would be to oh, for sure. give that update to all the cells in your body, right? So it's like suddenly you go from are there even ways to do that? Is it just virus delivery systems and stuff that you'd be looking at at that point? Say again? Would you just be looking at viruses to deliver something that's, if you want that's to That's one option. Like, yeah. um, you know, dandelion therapeutics person. with their lipid nanoparticles is another thing. But yeah. like, it, you know, uh, there's even um, one company we invest in called Eddy, which is using white blood cells. So everyone's using CAR T therapies to kill cancer cells. And it's like, what if you use CAR T and NK and all these other, you know, white blood cell therapies to deliver medicine rather than, you know, killing cancer. So it's kind of like, let's take a gun and swap out the bullet for a medication, right? Or for a g genetic engineering um, protocol. So kind of my point is, is that like, there are those tail end events where China's pursuing its own interests, right? I'm talking about like this um, multipolar world and it's like, but that outcome where suddenly like you've an aged U.S. population with an average IQ of a hundred, not a thousand, right? And you have an uh, average deadlift of ten pounds, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's certainly an average lifespan. Of, let's say a hundred years, right? Yeah. Let's be optimistic. And it's like, well, you know, in twenty years, how many like one k genomes could China pump out, right? And then how long would it take us to find that out? And it's like, well, we're 20 years behind there. So what do you- Because you had to wait for it to grow up into a person. So it's it's this weird kind of thing where into it's like- Into a person, into an adult. Yeah, yeah. yeah kid, um, kids are people too. <laughs> so that's that's one thing. And I, I don't, it's not like super germane to her thesis, or at least I don't think it is, but maybe I should rethink that. Um, but with a multipolar world, you not only have more niche specialization of like, startups serving particular markets, but you also have a higher degree of variance in outcomes with black swan events where, okay, if one country that was pursuing its own interests didn't have the same ethical framework as another country comes with comes up with the technology that changes the game, it really changes the game. And how willing are the other countries to play by the rules of that game um, if they're under if they're under a new set of constraints? I, I have no idea. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So a black swan event, as I understand, then is something that just changes the rules. Basically, it's it's it wasn't previously anticipated, and all of a sudden, it's a high impact, low probability event. Makes sense. That is by definition unpredictable, and so like in public markets, people will try to not necessarily predict but prepare. Right, you can't predict, but you can prepare. A lot of people have said that. Um, definitely not the first. And so, how do you do that from a technology standpoint in startup investing? Um, you know, it's generally, investing in things like platform plays or investing in things that tend to be overlooked because then, you know, you're quote minimizing the amount of um, potential conflicting black swans that you could get in those areas, right? It's the areas where people are clustering around similar technologies, areas where, you know, there's lots of buzzwords. Le the lemmings are all running off the cliff in one direction. Um, that Those unexpected events tend to have the most effect. So, you know, but I, I don't know if there's really a way to like predict or try to tackle it head on, right? So, because um, oftentimes the solution for these things tend to be, um, difficult to predict as well, right? So I, we may have gone over this in the previous podcast, but like, um, you know, the, the atom bomb, um, no one expected that, you know, everyone thought that, that was gonna cause nuclear holocaust, right? Everyone yeah, thought sure. that like, either Russia was gonna put the first bomb out or the US and then like, everyone was just gonna be atomic ash. Yeah, um, yeah. even the people that worked on it, right? Like Feynman has that, quote and surely you're joking Mr. Feynman where he's like why even build these bridges because it's just all going to be atomic ash yeah 100 percent yeah and so the one narrative is oh well actually it's ushered in you know the most peaceful and prosperous period humanity's ever experienced right like um my because of the fear of nuclear yeah retaliation my, I mean, my, yeah. my second cousin was he, he's he's American he was stationed in Germany 
um, in the 80s. And he was like looking across at the Russians and like they were ready to go. Like there could have been a major land war in Central Europe. Um, well, I, I had a friend who was in the Navy in the 80s who was also looking across at the Russian ships and they were ready to go. And I mean, there was a lot of that, like you said, but nobody ever fired around because of the fear of retaliation with nukes. Yeah. And so if um, if violence wasn't total, if it was incremental, it's like, oh, it's just one bullet. It's just two bullets. Right. Like World War Three probably would have already happened. Now, the counter argument is what if, you know, we had rolled the dice on the universe simulation. Not that I exactly believe in the universe simulation, but what assume it for a second. Simulation? So like, assume we knew all superpositions of atoms at this exact moment in time, we could run a thousand, you know, um, iterations of from now until 10 minutes forward. I mean, there would be some like Gaussian bell curve distribution. of Oh, events, and right? then you go for the middle and that's the likely outcome. Yeah, and maybe like in one yeah. in a thousand, I punch you in the face in the next 10 minutes, yeah. right? But like in most of them, we keep talking, right? And like all, all these different tail end events that are possible, but not probable. Yeah. Um, I so, just bite you and eat your liver. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> um, so maybe like mm -hmm. the fact that a nuke didn't go off is actually like quite unlikely. Maybe maybe mutually assured destruction was the most probable outcome. And just the fact that like something unprobable happened, neither of us nuked the other is the rare thing. And we shouldn't just like sit so comfortably and confident in the outcome, right? So like. Perfect. But we still have the capability to do it. I mean, it's never still gone the capability. Away. I don't think it's as likely as it was then. Knock on wood. Yeah. But um, you know, I'm I mean, inclined to agree. Just just as an example of that, apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, but there was a Soviet officer who, when they got some intel that there was a U.S. nuke heading towards Russia, or I guess the Soviet Union at the time, um, he was told, "All right, fire them off, salvo, right, deploy the nukes." And he didn't. Oh, that's interesting. What he was thinking was, okay, you know, half the world getting blown to smithereens is better than the whole world getting blown to smithereens. And so he he disobeyed orders. He didn't press the button. Now it turns out that what they were getting on their, I think, radar or whatever they were using. Probably uh, radar. It was a glitch. There was no US nuke that was deployed um, for Moscow. But, um, you know, if you reran that scenario oh, a thousand a times people would have chosen to how many times with a button <laughs> yeah. yeah for i sure. don't know yeah yeah that's that's really interesting that so that i mean and that's something i try to think through for a lot of these circumstances of like okay if this startup works out is it a probable thing right or is it a one in a thousand thing and so when you're dealing with um a multipolar world it's just much more difficult to tell and to navigate that's really interesting i'm guessing you look for somewhere between sure thing and one in a thousand though you're probably looking at in between probabilities there yeah it's it's not something it's not something we quantify um it's very much like my, my partner and I kind of use what we call the C word, right? Do you have a conviction about this? So like emotionally speaking, like we are a hundred percent maniacally certain that like this robotics company is going to be the next thing, right? That like it's inevitable. Now in the back of my head, like rational part of my brain is like, yeah, but probably not, right? But <laughs> but like on an emotional level, it's like it's the right technology, it's the right team, it's the right timing. Yeah, and the team genuinely gives a shit and is going to do yep. whatever it takes to, as you put it, go to hell and back to make it happen. The financial value is evident yeah. or is not evident, so like we can get in at a better price than the MBAs can, right? Like, <laughs> so all, all those things line up and we pull the trigger. So far, it, it, it's looking good, um, and. You know, there, there's just like something wonderful about kind of that stewardship where you find people who are so competent. Um, it's like, okay, yeah, like markets are bad, but like 
this person's competent, you give them a shoestring and bubble gum and they make it work. And so far, you know, for the fund investments, that's been the case. Um, and a number of them have had, um, you know, black swan events that they've had to deal with both like personally as well as professionally. And um, probably some good, some bad. Mainly bad. Yeah. <laughs> Brutal. Right. Well, like, that's the thing, right? So, like, positive black swans tend to be um, ill-defined and negative black swans tend to be very um, precise, right? So, it's like 9-11 was a negative black swan, right? Um, you know, regarding curing cancer, like, is there going to be a date where we're like, woo, we've cured cancer Woo, we have level five yeah, is autonomous that vehicles see it with the cancer no it's going to be Probably incremental not. and like there's not going to be a day where like we're all like celebrating and partying about it so yeah. like maybe there's an equal distribution of positive and negative black swans i have no idea but it's a I lot see, easier but there's not like an alpha. alien technology we'll get that'll make l5 autonomous possible most likely and then it's not like we're gonna figure out the cure to clients or all of a sudden cancer cancer it'll be incremental we'll figure it out little bits at a time well, Nick Anthony thinks transistors are high-end technology, but you can ask him about that separately. Wait, he thinks transistors are high-end technology, is that? Alien, from Alien. like Roswell. Oh, I mean, wait, really? You can ask him about I just it. interviewed him. Like, yeah, he's... I actually just talked to him earlier today. I... You, you should ask me to provide the question list. <laughs> For the next one, maybe. <laughs> it, it'll come yeah. out uh, before this one comes out, but Good. it hasn't come out yet. I'll have to watch it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it'll be good. I like that guy a lot. Uh, he's he's a good dude, and um, him and I have been trying to figure out some ways to collaborate with each other. So I'm kind of excited to see what that relationship brings in terms of new technologies and uh, you know just cool products we can build together. Yeah, he's like a stereotypical Midwestern tinkerer, and everyone I know who works with him has just like been yeah. He seems like a solid dude. I mean, that's that's kind of my take on it. He just seems like he's not trying to fuck anyone over, and and he's you know just a good dude. He's genuinely talented at what he does, and he seems to have a good work ethic and stoicism. He appears reliable. I mean, I, I everything I've seen from him so far, I like. Put it that way. So yeah, no, that guy that guy's pretty great. Have you met his dog, Winston, yet? No, I haven't. Same dog Winston, Winston from 1984. <laughs> I, I thought Winston Churchill, but like, okay. No. I haven't read 1984 in quite a while. What character is Winston again? Uh, the protagonist. <laughs> Fuck. You know, I read that when I was in high school, and I just, I don't remember that far back. I'm sorry. It's funny, man. Like, um, you know, I, I, I think I do need to read more Orwell. It's hard to pin him down right so like uh, i think uh neil postman wrote a book called amusing ourselves to death and like his book concludes with essentially juxtaposing orwell and huxley right so yeah huxley i think i've read actually i may not have brave read new orwell, world yeah, yeah probably yeah um so yeah brave new world had the soma both are dystopian yeah. right but like in 1984 in animal farm the the idea is that like totalitarianism and like the loss of freedom will be like people having their chains thrown on them in more the brave new world huxley ideas like people will willingly accept their chains yep. just make me numb right yeah, with yeah, the, exactly. with the soma. soma and so it's weird though because if you read any of um orwell's writings which were probably after um 1984 and animal farm um but just kind of as like his non-fiction kind of philosophy writings he sounds like Huxley. He doesn't sound like the Orwell from 1984. So he like kind of puts together like a screw tape letters sort of uh, polemical take of like, hey, like screw tape letters. Uh, so screw tape letters was written by um, C.S. Lewis and essentially talked about like, if you want to um, pull people away from God or from, you know, ultimate good truth and beauty, those sorts of things, um, you know, don't have them do evil things necessarily, have them do trivial, trite sort of things, right? And um, it's essentially this like older demon 
mentoring a younger demon. That's interesting. On how to get people to waste their time. Like it's, that's really interesting. It's a fun, fun book. Introduce them to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, anyways, um, so uh, lost my train. But um, Orwell kind of goes through this take where he, he explains these things. He's like, well, you know if you want to control how people think, like don't let them go out in nature, don't let them be by themselves, always have music playing when they're in public places like malls and commercial districts, like different things like that. And it sounds exactly like Huxley, so. It almost sounds like life a little bit. Like it it, it almost sounds like, yeah, tw 2020s in America. Yeah. Um, but it, it's weird, it's, it's hard to kind of pin these guys down because like it does, you know, you want to put people in a box, but they often change their perspectives after a while. And it's also interesting the fact that, you know, Huxley and um, Orwell, you know. Huxley was a weird dude. I mean, that guy was like a hardcore intellectual elitist in like an interesting way. Yeah. And he was, you know, both of them were, you know, politically on the left. They would kind of probably mm -hmm. be like um, democratic socialists might be like the right term, could be the wrong term for them. And so it's like, but they were like the most successful criticisms of, um, you know, totalitarianism in the 20th century. Yeah. At least from a literature standpoint, right? Yeah. Um, and you had others that like, oh, you would expect would have came out on top, maybe like um, Ayn Rand or um, Robert Heinlein, but it's like they didn't, right? And it's like, I, I think, you know, the arguments and um, the beauty was articulated a lot better by Orwell and Huxley. And really in the end, it turned out that, you know, Orwell was kind of on Huxley's side. So maybe just Huxley. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, Huxley, um, I don't know. He just, he, he strikes me as kind of a, a weird dude, but I guess Orwell probably was too. I, I don't know that I'd I'd enjoy spending time with either of those people. They elaborate on Huxley. I don't know what you're referring to. Um, so I don't know. Like I, I was hearing recently that he had this opinion uh, regarding like you know psychedelic drugs in like maybe it was like the '70s where where this came around. But I guess the idea, or maybe it was the '60s, '60s or '70s. But he had this idea that like they should be like distributed to like the upper class in order to help them elevate their thinking. So I, I think I heard this in like that How to Change Your Mind that came out recently on Netflix, but was before that a book. And um, I mean, a lot of the executives right now are using psychedelics. So. Most likely, yeah. So what's wrong with his prophecy came true? Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. Like if somebody with like 180 IQ takes like, you know, acid, are they gonna come up with a better idea than somebody with like, you know. Happened with PCR. Maybe IQ, probably. Oh, that's how that came out? Yeah. It did not. Um, the guy who invented PCR, um, so gosh, hope I get this right. Polymerase chain reaction, essentially a process for replicating and reading DNA strands, um, agarose gel, you know, different ways to do it. But he, uh, story is, took LSD and um, was able to envision himself sitting on the molecule and seeing how the DNA strands would um, split and anneal. And, That's interesting. And he couldn't come up with the idea until then. And, um, you know, I mean, there were a number of other studies, like uh, there was a Stanford study that came out around the same time. It was probably, I think, while he was at Stanford. I think he was at Stanford. I'm not sure on that. Um, but they would give LSD to like people in other departments <laughs> and <it was> something <laughs> they would like ask them like, what big question are you working on? And, um, then like give them LSD and within like a couple of weeks, like they would figure it out like 80% or something yeah, like that would, would figure it out. Um, although yeah, with, you know, a lot of authors and people who maybe, you know, on the big five personality trait, like are very high in openness, like, you know, if you take psychedelics and those increase your openness by another standard deviation, like, is that a good thing? Does that like push you so far off the bell curve that your brain falls out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what was interesting about Huxley's point of view, as I understood it, was that he, he thought that those psychedelics should be withheld and only given to the intellectually elite, where I guess somebody like, um, 
the hell was that one guy's name that just wanted to give acid to everyone? Um, Timothy Leary. It yeah. was like of the opinion that you should just put it in the water supply and everybody should have access and whatever. Like, I don't necessarily think that, you know, like, you know, like, I don't, I'm not going to discover, like, PCR, for instance. Like, I, I just... Well, it's already been discovered. Well, I know. But, like, I wouldn't have discovered it. I don't think even with the application of, you know, whatever. Like, because like, I just don't know anything about that world. I mean, that's not my, my area of expertise. And so... I think the assumption is, like, if people were more open and people were more creative... Um, the, it would be a net positive. Well, that's Leary's assumption. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the water supply. Like, I'm yeah. telling you that. And yeah. I, I haven't read that point on Huxley before, but, you know, if you assume that, like, maybe, like, 20% have 80% of the impact, you have, like, a Pareto distribution. Well, and the idea is that they can pass those ideas down without the aid of... Safely in a yeah. way that kind of anneals and, like, codifies, right? So, like... Yeah. Um, Kaufman, a lot of these other people at the Santa Fe Institute have this idea of like the edge of chaos, right? Um, you have this boundary layer where there's like total chaos where like new creative things happen. And then there's like totally static in between the dynamic, 100% dynamic and 100% static. There's a boundary layer where things are starting to come apart and things are starting to form together. Um, in terms of ideas. Yep, I, yeah. but I mean, it's it's wider ranging than that, right? Like, in terms of ecosystems, so you have a boundary layer between like a field and a forest, and um, you know, there's there's an edge of chaos between the different species that exist between you know the field versus the forest, right? You could just talk about fireflies. Some firefly species are evolved for open situations where they um, will lantern less frequently so that they can still find a mate but not get in by predators. Yeah, it makes sense. Species that are interacting with foliage, like in a forest. Got might... lantern all the time because no one's gonna see them otherwise. Yep, exactly. They won't get laid and they won't continue the bloodline. <laughs> <laughs> you should be a biologist. It's perfect. Alex. Um, and then you see, and you see that. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Taniana's, uh, what is it? Um, like sex of all creation or something by my bedside. I haven't heard of it. Uh, I, I'm mispronouncing the name, but it's it's um, it's it's like a like a columnist article from like the perspective of somebody that's like, you know, like I just seem to keep eating my mate. Well, of course you do. You're a praying mantis, you know, and like, so it's it's kind of these back and forths, and it's hypothetical, and it's kind of funny. Uh, one of my friends recommended it. It's just into insects, and so I, I checked it out because it was kind of amusing at the time. Yeah, so. Got it. But anyway, so like we're talking about that with regard to fireflies. Yeah, um, no, it, it, you see that with um, robotics and stars as well, right? There's things that are cutting edge and then there are things that are bleeding edge, you know, and like what is something you can actually commercialize and where does it fit along that grain? So, so how do you differentiate cutting edge from bleeding edge? Because obviously bleeding edge is more so but like, where do you draw the line in terms of what you consider to be one versus the other? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, in my mind, something that's cutting edge has a you know, strong advantage over the incumbent competitors and something that's bleeding edge, you can't even deploy to production. Ah, truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, that, that's often the risk of like, okay, what's the time frame that you can take this thing that's leading edge and make you cutting edge, right? And like, what are the engineering risks associated with it? Um, how much is an unknown and how do you kind of restructure those unknowns into knowns, um, those sorts of things. And um, oftentimes that's not even like a question of like what people can problem solve versus what they can't, but like what they outsource versus what they insource, which especially with, um, the current market, you know, and with things like trends that we've discussed before, like horizontal integration and a multipolar world is um, growing ever more important. So really like, and, and, and that's not even the big question in my mind, like the question is more long lines of follow on capital. Cause like a lot of these deep tech companies like tend to be fairly capital intensive, right? Yeah, and you're kind of like, 
building them out to own the market, um, especially in the space Which industry. means they've got to get follow-on capital if you're an early stage yep. investor. Hardware, different things like that. Like, okay, you have 500 million in letters of intent. <laughs> like, that's great. And like, that could be significant. But, um, you know, are you going to find enough investors to actually push behind that? To get um, you to be able to fill those orders. Yeah, the, the financing actually seems to be more of a risk than, you know, something being, quote, bleeding edge. That's really interesting. Well, I would also think like the enabling technology. So if you've got something that's so pie in the sky that, you know, it, it pivots or relies upon rather its assumptions about, you know, enabling technologies that, Probably are true, but may or may not be true, we'll say, because, you know, it seems like you're living in the realm of research and academia. You know, I feel like the risk a lot of it might also be, you know, like, are all the assumptions correct? Like, can this actually be achieved? Yeah. Another way that we like to look at it is um, if the commercial application is an unexpected one, right? So you kind of have this, like, emergent order of... Um, convenient accidents. Um, so, you know, one, one example I was actually talking to a portfolio company about today, don't ask how we got on the subject, but Black Sabbath, um, nice. you know, when they, <laughs> the rock band that started heavy metal, um, they were, when they were planning to go full time with, you know, Ozzy Osbourne as the lead singer. So like before Ronnie James Dio, um, Tony Iommi was still working in a factory, I think in Birmingham, um, United oh. Kingdom. Oh, okay. So like kind of big, UK. like Rust Belt, but for, you know, England. Yeah. And um, it was like a, you know, kind of typical Friday afternoon when like accidents happen in factories, right? And um, he, this was his last Friday and then he was going to go off and be a professional full-time musician, chief his dream. And he, I think was using a bandsaw and cut off the tip of at least his uh, ring finger, if ah. not a few of his other fingers, right? And it's like, well, you're the guitarist, like, what are you gonna do? And so he melted um, like bottle caps to the tips of his fingers and tried to play the guitar, couldn't press the strings down fully. So he ended up having to detune his guitar, which made it sound heavier, right? That chunk, 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 chunk. Oh, that's interesting. And so that heavy metal sound we get is because he hacked fingertips off of his fingers that's, in a, that's a beautiful accident. thing yeah um so anyways you know we see that with a lot of our portfolio companies. Django reinhardt was missing three fingers i'm pretty sure that's right he lost in a wagon Django. fire yeah yeah he lost it how in a wagon oh he's a french gypsy right a and wagon so they had fire. wagons and i mean one of the wagons burned up and i mean i guess he was in it and he lost three fingers yeah it's all, uh, it's all about constraints. Which ones yeah. did he have? He, um, I think he had, I think he had these two, but I could be wrong. It might've been like these two. Wow. Oh my but gosh. He was, yeah, he was like doing that the whole time. And I mean, the hot club jazz is, you know, totally pioneered by him. Like nobody else. I mean, a lot of people emulate that sound, but up until Django, nobody else played that sound. So yeah. So the, the bleeding edge kind of conundrum is often like, People are just curious. Actually, you know how Django Reinhardt survived World War II? I don't know. As how. a gypsy in a Nazi occupied area? Sounds like fun. Uh, yeah. So it was because um, there was a Luftwaffe colonel who was nicknamed Dr. Jazz who took a, a shining to him. Like he liked his music. And I think he I have him. heard this. Yeah. So this guy would like tune his like radio in his, you know, playing to allied jazz music every time he would go to bomb the chant, you know, the British or whatever. And he was just like, I fucking Django Reinhardt's legendary. You know, don't, don't kill that guy. You know, he's great. So, that uh, nepotism was fairly rampant in yeah. Nazi Germany. That makes sense. I'm grateful it was in that case. Cause I love Django. I mean, he's, he's amazing. I was in Paris recently and there was a Django Reinhardt alley and I got all tingly and you know, I was like real happy just cause. He's one of my favorite musicians of all time. So, yeah, you, I mean, you see it with um, a lot of deep tech startups as well, where essentially these people aren't even trying to start a company. Um, they have some technical issue that's just bothering them personally. They're trying to solve it for maybe one 
particular field, like surgical robotics. And then suddenly, you know, they realize or someone else realizes that it's applicable to this wide range of other things that has nothing at all to do with the use case that they're pursuing. And then they just like kind of fall into this new sea of opportunity. And I'm thinking of like Pied Piper from the show Silicon Valley. Fall in love with that. Yeah. Um, I, w- what season? It was too uh, painful and first, personal. Oh, you didn't like it. No, I loved it. It was just too it was similar. very to on the nose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit too much. Yeah. So the whole company, right? I mean, the guy starts it like to share music and it, it's just a really good compression algorithm is the premise of the show. Yeah, okay. So it's yeah, applicable exactly. to everything, but he only sees this, this little teeny thing that is bothering him personally. Yeah, you know? so I mean, we, we see that all the time. And I think that's the most exciting quote, like bleeding edge things that we invest in because it's a kind of non-linear path to success. People don't expect it to work out. They're just having fun, being open to trying new and creative things, whether it's algorithms or hardware stacks. And then, you know, they pursue it, stumble across this thing. In a way, it's a it's a moat because like a lot of these things that get invented, like Velcro, for instance, like where did that come from? <sighs> Stor- stories uh, differ. Um, so one story is that you know NASA invented Velcro to help astronauts deal with zero G. Other people would say that NASA was trying to get more money. <laughs> And it was actually a um, a guy in Switzerland who noticed um, like uh, seed pods from plants that were hooking into his jacket and his sheep as he, you know, oh, tra- traversed the Swiss Alps. I assume across some beautiful meadow, right? Yeah, probably. That's for, a for, really really picturesque area. Um, so, so so that's one example, um, but. Yeah, oftentimes, whether it's that or, you know, even like a lot of algorithms that people have used, like the unsupervised stuff tends to come up with the most unexpected things. And those unexpected things tend to have the strongest competitive advantage um, because it's stuff that you couldn't possibly plan out. Didn't, I mean, this is kind of macabre, but didn't NASA have like a spacecraft, like incinerate the whole crew? Because Velcro was like very combustible in high oxygen environments. I don't know. I think I heard something about that, like the loop side, not the hook side. Loop side was like combustible? Super, yeah, kind of flammable. And were they still using seed pods from Switzerland? I don't know what they were using for the material, <laughs> but I. I I heard that like a spacecraft just, you know, incinerated the crew because, you know, like on the pad because it was just, there was like a little teeny fire, but it turned into a big one because of all the Velcro. Please don't be offended. I'm a little oh, skeptical. I'm not sure that happened. Okay. No, I'm not offended. Um, eh. It'll be in the show notes afterwards, right? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll look it up. I might be wrong on this. Um, you want to you put money on it? Ten bucks? I don't really gamble. Okay, fair enough. I only gamble on things I'm fairly certain on. <laughs> well, I did admit I might be wrong. And no worries. Is there anything you want to plug uh, before we call it? For sure. So, um, you know, kind of the main focus of Reinforced Ventures is reinforcing portfolio companies with experts. So we're, we're always looking to bring on new individuals who want to join our fund. We're not as focused on the institutional side, although you know, we have as well, but mainly like bringing in key people who can help with deal flow, due diligence, um, customer introductions for portfolio companies, key talent hires, things like that. So you know, people can find us on angelist.com. And if you're a startup who's you know in a overlooked area of deep tech, you're trying to commercialize something, even if you haven't formed a company yet, like we'd be happy to speak with you. Um, we invest very, very early in Creed and what I call napkin companies. And um, yeah, we'd love to have that conversation so people can just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, 
and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the